My name is Gary Gaddis. Uh, thank you very much for, for having me here today. I'm going to talk to you about fun and monetization. A uh, little history about Spacetime Studios. So Spacetime was founded back in 2005 uh, by four guys, myself, Anthony Summers, Cinco Barnes, and Jake Rogers. Anthony's a technologist, Cinco is a designer, Jake is in art, and I'm in production. So it's kind of the four pillars of game development that founded this company. Our background is in hardcore PC MMOs. So we built and ran Star Wars Galaxies, as Craig said. Uh, partners did the Wing Commander games. All the way back to Ultima Online, uh, our, our experience kind of, kind of goes back. And we've worked with each other for quite some time as well. So we started in 2005 to build a very large ground and space game for NCSoft. NCSoft is a Korean publisher. This was back when people were still investing huge amounts of money into making what they wanted to do World of Warcraft killers. Uh, so it was a $25 million product. Our goal with them was we would own the tools and technology, and they would own the intellectual property. Uh, and it was, it was a lot of fun. This was our first company to do together. We scaled it up. We hired this amazing visual director, a guy named David Levy, who went on to do Tron 2. He was an Assassin's Creed guy. Uh, it was beautiful. It was, it was big. Uh, and it was canceled. Uh, so, in 2008, after the Christmas party, we were informed that the game was cancelled. NCSoft had shipped a couple of other games that were not very well received critically, and uh, Korea kind of freaked out and pulled all the plugs out of North American development, and we were caught up in that wash. It was okay. Uh, it, it was soul-crushing at the time, but we were able to maintain ownership of the technology. We'd invested about 12 million bucks in this client-server, super-powerful MMO engine. And so we went out and kind of shopped ourselves around and picked up another gig. Uh, I, I can't tell you who it was, but it's a company whose name rhymes with uh, uh, Frisney. Uh, it was an educational MMO, uh, and it was very, very cool product as well. Uh, imagine uh, a huge curriculum that's all kind of cross-referenced, and it was going to learn how people learn and feed them content kind of along the way. Great, very, very ambitious thing to do, uh, and this was also uh, canceled. So uh, in 2010, well, this, this was late 2009. We were, we're sitting around and we're, we're wondering what we're going to do. This was kind of our second gut punch that we'd received as a company. We'd scaled up and down and up and down and up and down. And we weren't sure that we wanted to do it anymore, but we realized we were all doing this, just like everybody else. We're all playing with our iPhones. We're like, well, why can't we be playing together? These things are all connected and, and everybody microtrans is on them already. They're very powerful devices. Just because nobody's done this does not mean it can't be done. So we set off to make the world's first 3D mobile MMO, a game called Pocket Legends. But before we did, we wanted to explore the publishing pipelines on iOS. So we scaled all the way down to six guys. Uh, the four partners, a guy named Rick Delschmidt and a guy named uh, Jason Decker. And uh, built a few games on iOS just to see how the publishing pipelines went, if we could port our engine over to it. And it went really well. These games sold literally dozens of copies, uh, Shotgun Granny and Zombie Weatherman uh, among them. And, uh, and after we had done that, we, we figured that we had what we needed to do to build Pocket Legends. So we did a complete pivot in 2010. Somewhere along the way, Apple got wind of it. Uh, it might have been because I sent an email to Steve underscore jobs at apple.com. He did read every email that went to him, by the way. Uh, they came down and brought us a couple of prototype big devices. These were the iPads. This was before the iPads ever came out. And it was super secret squirrel kind of stuff. They, they had to be locked to a desk in a dark room with double locks and no sanitation in the room and whatnot. Uh, but it was very, very cool. I remember the first time I fired that up, it was, a, it was a very powerful experience for us. So in the course of a month, we ported it from phone to iPads and launched Pocket Legends on, uh, on April 3rd, 2010, along with the iPad. So the biggest thing that we learned with Pocket Legends was not to wall off the fun. Um, we spent a lot of time on our little play loop. So in traditional MMOs, on PC MMOs, the, the kill, loot, equip, loop takes a couple of minutes or so. Uh, and we knew that it had to be fast. So on mobile, we got it down to about 15 to 20 seconds. Super quick, super fun. We polished the heck out of it. And this little thing became the kernel of everything that we would build beyond that. And then we put them together in a level where you would go out and you'd kill a bunch of minions and a mini boss and a boss. And this was done in three to five minutes, which is about the right amount of time for standing in line at the grocery store or hanging out in the dentist chair or whatever, the mobile play time, people will tell you, is, is about five minutes or so. So we structured these level loops into three to five minute sessions. And then we put in a bunch of levels in a campaign. So we had the social area, a town, and players would hang out in this town and they'd go out and run these levels and come back in. And it was a rip-roaring good time. These were all thematically based. So we had 
you know, kind of the gentle intro forest and then the darker forest and then the castle and then the ice and the fire and all the fantasy stuff that you guys are familiar with. We were noobs at monetization. We didn't know what we were going to do. We, we went free to play because some people advised us to go free to play, but we didn't know really how we were going to make our money. So we, we had players buy everything swords and shields, elixirs and potions, and we also put a paywall in because we figured if this game is so much fun, then people will pay us to continue to do the fun. That's not necessarily the case. Uh, about a year into the game, we were looking at some early analytics on it and we noticed we were still selling a lot of maps. So this was the paywall right here. This was, this was the major source of our revenue, but we also noticed this is the levels of players that everybody was stacking up right here at level 13, which is where the paywall was, and then just dropping off. And so we theorized if we dropped the paywall that we would eventually make more money by pouring people down. And that is what happened. So our average session length doubled, uh, 23 minutes or so. Average daily time was about an hour. Average monthly time, this is a crazy stat here, 34 hours a month, 33 and a half hours a month on the Legends games. This is what our guys were playing. The average Android playtime is 10 hours all games. The average iOS playtime is about 15 hours a month all games. Our players were staying in for more than double that just in our game. So we knew that we had something special going on. We took a look at the monetization after the wall. We had a very nice spread of different items and different item packs that, that we could use to tweak and kind of continue to, to make money on. So, so we went from you know, this where there were just little slivers that we weren't making a lot of money on to this really well-balanced kind of nice monetization spread. We launched Star Legends in early 2011. Star Legends was a reskin of Pocket Legends. We went back to our original intellectual property, Black Star, and, uh, and, and made it into, uh, into a new game called Star Legends. And what we were finding out then uh, is the same thing that everybody knows, which is acquisition and customer acquisition is probably one of the greatest challenges that any developer is going to face. All you guys are making games. Everybody here is making games. There's a crap ton of games being made more and more and more every day. It costs between a dollar to two dollars ish to buy a customer. So the the way to find customers was very important to us, and we did it by going places where other people were not. Uh, we we went global. Um, we made sure that our game was playable everywhere. Pocket Legends is played in every country in the world, uh, with the exceptions of North Korea and Cuba. And I guess we can't get stats out of those guys, but um, we, we made it so that we could also play on very, very high latency connections. So it plays on Wi-Fi, 4G, 3G, all the Gs, uh, all the way down to edge network. So we, we got very deep penetration into these third world countries that were just developing and built a very loyal player base there. And then we also went to some other kind of hardware providers. So a very good way to expand your visibility is to, is to partner. BizDev still works. Uh, there are as many uh, hardware providers and service providers that are struggling and trying to find stuff that looks cool to put on their devices as there are game developers. So finding these guys and making partnerships with them and using them to kind of cross promote was a really good strategy for us. You can see this was our Pocket Legends uh, uh, number of players, uh, unique accounts, and this is where we launched on Android. This was uh, November of, of 2010 and everything really kind of started to hockey stick for us then. Um, dark Legends was our next game. It was a very dark and sexy vampire game, and it's when we really started to pay attention to, to analytics. We hired a guy named Jeff Petrie. Is, is Jeff here? Jeff is here. That's Jeff. Uh, Jeff came on board. Yeah, give him a hand. He's a really badass guy. Wait, 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 wait. Sorry, hang on, hang on, hang on. Okay, Jeff came on board. He came from Zynga. Uh, Austin and he's like well your, your, your art is cute but let me show you the science of how these games are made and, and he really brought a deep understanding and, and started to school us on what we could apply our development bandwidth to. Before we were just you know we're four guys who love to make games we think this is cool and this is cool and let's just do this and that but we weren't really paying attention to, to the, the numbers and making critical decisions based on the numbers. This is, uh, this is a slide of Jeff's all the nice uh, smart guy slides from here on out are, are Jeff's Thank you for letting me steal those, Jeff. Um, what's the funnel? We say WTF around the office a lot. Uh, in this case, we were very specifically looking to try to understand when to patch. We noticed there was a large drop off of players to patch. If you've got a, an, an application that is 50 megs, you don't have to make that be a 50 meg download. You can have it be a 
10 meg download and then patch out the rest of the data to the players after they've downloaded that 10 meg download. And what we discovered was uh, that was exactly the right thing to do. We had big downloads with little patch, little downloads with big patches, and we found that players were much more likely to sit through a patch that had your game screen on it that was showing them stuff than they were to sit through the initial download. Um, and we actually went a little bit further. We, we broke it up into a couple of different places where we would have the tutorial in the first patch. Uh, I think Arcane Legends is maybe 10 megs or so. And then while players are playing the tutorial, we're streaming in the rest of the stuff kind of in the background. This is another look at the funnel. And you'll see here these two big spikes. These, this is basically how many players drop off at each different step kind of along the way. You want them to get down to the bottom and, and start paying. Uh, the biggest spikes here are still funnel, but that is, uh, that's as efficient as we could get it, and we, we tried a lot. So we started looking for the next ones, and these are all the dungeon levels, and we started seeing big spikes here at two and four and three. And so we would do things like um, shorten the levels, make them uh, less tiles in the levels, uh, make the mobs uh, less, less, less difficult to kill, uh, shorten the XP curve, and, and let, let players kind of get through the stuff kind of faster. With Arcane Legends, we brought the full force of all this analytical knowledge that Jeff brought to the table to bear. And it was fantastic. This, this game has done 10 times what any of our other games have done. And it's really exciting and engaging to actually be able to make design decisions based on real numerical data. Uh, I'll show you a couple of things that, uh, that, that are just kind of typify what we'll do. Um, we, we look at the stuff on a weekly basis and during soft launch we'll look at all this kind of stuff on a daily basis and actively make decisions and kind of measure and see what goes on. This is when players first purchase in Arcane Legends and it's a nice bell curve here. You can see a lot of guys do it right up at the front. These are probably existing Legends players that are coming over that, that know that they like to play these games. And then really right here towards the mid band between 7 and 12, this is when people really start to pay. So we look at this and we say, well, we want to get guys down to that level 7 and 12. What do we do? Again, do we make the mobs easier? Do we, do we make the levels shorter? But then we look at the first purchase of the things. So we've got, this is when they purchase, this is what they purchase. And what they're purchasing, this is all, this is all due to deaths and wanting to make it past the mobs. So Revenge and Revive is what happens when you die. You can, re you can revive, hey, whoa, hey. You can revive uh, uh, and, and go right in to kill the mobs again. Elixirs are things that kind of boost up your character. So we didn't want to kind of chip away at that revenue. So what we ended up doing with these, I, I believe, was just kind of shortening the XP curve so that players could kill these things and get to those levels a little bit faster. So in conclusion, do not wall off the fun. It is all about the fun. Uh, expand your horizons. Try to be a, a big fish in as many ponds as you possibly can. Um, chart your turn. Make sure you know where players are dropping and what they're doing. And find the money in the fun. There's, there's a lot of money out there, but it, it really does need to be fun first. A uh, brief epilogue about Star Legends and Pocket and Dark and, and Arcane. We ran some numbers recently, and uh, w we found out that, that these games have been played for a total of 7,300 years. That's older than wine. That's a long, long, long amount of wasted time, and I'm kind of a little bit guilty about that, but not too much. Uh, and our little kill loot equip loop that's been done, that's been played six billion times which is a pretty staggering number. We're, we're, we're very excited about that. So please remember, it is all about the fun. I'm going to leave you guys with, uh, with a video that we made to, to tell the players what we were doing to go completely free. So we, we make games. This is what you've chosen to do for a living. You should have fun doing it as well. This is, this is your life, and you're dedicating your entire career to this. Numbers are great, and it's really great to go educated into the whole process, but you should also have a lot of fun doing it. So this video was done by uh, Fernando Blanco, uh, my partner Cinco Barnes, and it was inspired by a guy named uh, Crazy Eddie out of, out of L.A. Happy birthday, Pocket Legends! It's been one year since we launched, so what do we do to celebrate? We give it all away! Have you ever wanted to play a game for free? Don't try to stop me! I'm doing it! Why? Because I'm local! Fort Castle, free. free. Phantom Crypts, free. free. The Lost Expedition, free. The whole alien part, I said, said free. free. It doesn't add up. 50% off, no. 75% off, boom. It's free. I'll say it all We're declaring war on high prices. Talking about pocket legends. This is Black Star. You don't even know what about it.
Have fun out there, guys. Thank you. Any questions for Gary? Uh -huh. Hi, Gary. Hello. Um, what I'm gleaning from these talks and what you've confirmed for me is that sort of the key to success is play everywhere. All countries, all devices, all operating systems. How did you do that in terms of QAing all the devices, screen sizes, languages, I know that's a big question, but in a nutshell, can you kind of just talk about sure, that for a second? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, so the question was, how did we go uh, wide on our platforms, et cetera? So iOS was easy. It's got just two or three different kind of formats. Android is, is crazy because it's got all the rest in there. Um, and we really struggled with that for a while. Uh, I think with, with Dark Legends, we came up with a, a procedure. It's, it's really it's all about the UI. So, so we've got a C++, OpenGL, 3D engine. We could render that at any different size. But the UI was the most challenging part. And what we ended up doing was making it just kind of a quadrant-based UI system. So everything slaps down to the left corner, slaps up to the right corner, and we can scale it based on that. And that was, that was really a, a pretty big breakthrough for us. Um, publishing pipes are, are very smooth and easy and, and, and exist. It, you know, global versus US versus UK is, is really a couple of clicks and, and, and one button on it. So there's no excuse to not go global. And, and none of these titles were localized either. This was something that was interesting for us. Uh, I, would, I would love to localize. We've done it before with Galaxies. We're actually localizing our next game. But you don't have to localize. You, you just need to be in the store. A next step up from that is localizing your store descriptions, which is a pretty, pretty effective thing to do. You're welcome. Hi. You mentioned that the bundle size, uh, by just decreasing it from, say, 50 megs to 10, you would see a increase in the number of people who actually completed the install. I'm sorry. I can't hear you. With respect to the, the bundle size, making it smaller, and getting more installs. Yes. What was the sort of percentage increase for, for every, like, 10 megs that you knock off? Roughly. Question is, uh, how efficient did it get as we changed the, the patch sizes, basically? Um, significant. Uh, we went from probably 60% of people making it through the patches to 97% of people making it through the patches. So, so very, very significant increases. Anything you can do up at the top of the funnel is, is going to affect how you do down at the bottom, I would strongly encourage all of you guys to look at your patch sizes and play with it. If you've got a 50 meg game, try making it a 20 meg game with a 30 meg patch and, and see how that goes. I think you'll be very, very surprised. Hi, so you mentioned um, that you to get people up to the levels where they're spending money the first time purchase, mm -hmm. you said you made it easier at the beginning levels to, to reach those levels. Mm -hmm. So doesn't that kind of ruin the difficulty curve? And would you, wouldn't you expect a different distribution of when people first, first purchases happen in terms of levels? I think it depends on how you do it. There's a number of different things that you can use to change how people get there. One is, is changing the XP curve. So if I need 10 mobs to get to level two, we can change that to, to eight or so. Um, we can also change how difficult the mobs are so that it takes less strikes to do so or, uh, or, or change the number of tiles that are available kind of in a thing. And um, no, it didn't really change the difficulty curve of the game. The game is a, is a long form game. These are, these are very, very long cycle, long play games. We've got content in there that people play for days and days and days and days, if not months, if not years with, with, with Pocket Legends. So if there's engaging content kind of everywhere along the line of it, if you look for those walls where people are, are dropping off, moving them on will only encourage them to pay more. Any other questions? Cool. Thank you guys very much. Appreciate it.